organizations. We're going to spend um, quite a bit of time, um, you know, specifically on uh, the reframing concept, but we're also going to cover other aspects of the book that I think it is critical uh, for you to know. And so um, here's the agenda. Anytime I speak anywhere, I always throw an agenda slide up. It doesn't mean that I necessarily cover everything in the agenda, but it's, it's my intent to, uh, to address this. And the reason uh, why I have picked these specific things out of an entire book is I think they're each going to be important to you, either as you're doing your uh, final project or just important concepts for you to know in, in everyday uh, business life. And or ministry. Um, the first thing I want to generally talk about, and by the way, um, anytime someone is going to present to you research <coughs> or, or academic theory, it's your responsibility to, to step back and say, for my national culture or for the national culture I'm trying to operate under, uh, does, this, does this theory fit? Uh, that's a critical, critical uh, concept to have in the back of your mind, regardless of, of the source of information. Um, so here's what I think is, is very important for you to understand about the four frame orientation. Uh, there were two Harvard uh, Business School professors who were assigned to teach a course together. They were coming from different disciplines, and they couldn't get along. Now, whether that clash was personality-based or whether that clash was functional-based, you know, on their expertise is unclear. However, <laughs> they came up with the four-frame orientation to help them teach the class and, and resolve their own conflicts as they were teaching the class. So, so let, me, let me talk about what is a frame, uh, you know, based on, based on the four frame orientation. <clears throat> and I'm also going to use the word paradigm by a fellow by the name of Thomas Kuhn. Uh, because I view them kind of as synonymous, the word uh, frame and the word period. Um, a frame is the mental model that somebody is using at a specific point in time as they're trying to solve a problem. And that model is based on assumptions. You could use the word biases of what that individual believes how the world works. Uh, I would stress that culture by culture, there may be more than four frames, or there may be frames different from the four frames we're going to talk about today. Um, within specifically the four frame model, most people oper out of, operate out of one or two primary frames. Um, and that's driven uh, both by uh, their personality, but also their functional responsibilities. Um, and where they where they are in an organization, um, and if we have time, I'm going to come back and and share an interesting anecdote. But um, let me make sure first I get through the, the rest of the material. Okay, the structural frame. This is very much um, a U.S. oriented. It's also a German national culture oriented concept. And it's that um, the best way to know if we're being successful as an organization is to have key performance indicators and look at those key performance indicators and adjust how we're managing and how the business is doing based on those measurements. Uh, you know, I mentioned the German culture. The German culture, it's so important that um, rules be written down and that rules be followed. Um, and that also, you know, is kind of uh, an example of the structural frame. Now, let me talk about the word MBA phenomenon, why I have that here. Um, in U.S. business, 
there is a specific affect that certain people who have an MBA degree take, and that affect is because I have an MBA and because I've run the numbers, and if I present things to you on a numerical basis, you should automatically just accept what I said. And that's what the MBA phenomenon is. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when I was taking a course as a graduate student on this specific textbook, um, I went out and at that time looked at 140 peer reviewed articles about the four frame methodology. And I, and I discovered a very, very interesting article where the researchers had gone and analyzed um, the uh, Harvard Business Review case studies and the documents they put out and which frame were they teaching their MBA students to operate under. And what they found was an inordinate emphasis on the structural frame, which would tend to, you know, support, you know, this concept of an MBA, uh, you know, the MBA phenomenon. Later on, when we talk about the Mintzberg's um, model of organizational structure, we're going to get back into uh, the structural frame. All right, the human resource frame. There's two fundamental ways that people can, can view, business leaders particularly, can view people that work for them. One is that their people are assets, they're an important part of the organization, and that we want to keep the same people we have working here right now for the long term because as they gain experience, they become more effective and more valuable. A different way to view um, employees is that employees are raw materials like any other raw material. And I'm going to hire them. I'm going to consume that raw material. And when I no longer really uh, need, that, need that raw material, I'm just going to get rid of it uh, and go hire some other employee. Uh, interestingly enough, um, when I was uh, the vice president of uh, and CIO for AAA of New York and contact centers, um, the CEO had brought in, we had an opening for a vice president of travel, and the CEO brought in um, a, a candidate that was interviewing. And when uh, the management team had interviewed this person, I went to see the CEO and I, I asked him a question. I said, are you trying to change the culture of our management team in this hire? And he looked at me and he said, Bob, why are you asking me that? I mean, it's kind of a left field question if you think about it. I said, well, I said my observation is this, this particular individual personality may not fit within the organization and the management team and may create a tremendous amount of conflict. So, you know, I, I need to just bring that to your attention that you need to think through um, the ramifications of if you hire this person, what are you going to do if there's conflict? And he had a, now, under, let me explain something else about this particular CEO. The beginning of his career, he was a professional basketball player in Europe. At the midpoint in his career, he was the general manager of two different USA-based uh, basketball teams. Okay, so his orientation is, is, is of employees around him. He said, well, you know what, Bob? I always go for the absolute best athlete I can hire at the time. And if I've made a mistake, the only thing it costs me is money. Money in the form, of what he meant was, I'm going to have to get rid of the guy and I'm going to have to pay him a big paycheck to go away. Uh, that, I would suggest to you, <clears throat> is an example of, of the second approach to human resources. And that approach is not, I stress, is not what we would consider appropriate in the form frame orientation. Uh, the human resource frame is more oriented around developing employees for the future, for the long term. And, um, and that means that at times we may, in the structural frame, uh, 
do something different uh, because of that. Uh, and I'm going to talk about again this uh, where the human resource frame fits into an organizational structure uh, when we talk about uh, Mintzberg's organizational model. The political frame. Uh, let me start off by making a couple of bold statements. I personally, and, and in my own practice, believe this is the wrong title for the frame. And I believe that the use of the word political has had, brings with it a lot of cultural baggage in the U.S. that gets in the way of what's really being accomplished here. Really what the political frame is all about is that a leader who needs to make organizational change has many different stakeholders and they need to evaluate how to best um, work with and gain the support of stakeholders, but also um, not every stakeholder in every single situation's uh, needs can be met. And so if a need's not going to get met, how do you communicate to that particular stakeholder constituency, uh, the, you, know, you know, the issues behind it? Now, the, uh, the book has some wonderful, wonderful content and a practical basis that you will need, I guarantee you will need this when you go to do your final project from the point of view of can you even do your final project if you can't get support of certain stakeholders, okay? So please concentrate on uh, understanding what's said there so that when the time comes that you do your final project, you can come back and, and, and from, a, from a tactics, think that through. Now, let me stress something absolutely critical. Um, the political frame is all about how we should compromise on the tactics we're using. The political frame, though, is not a justification to compromise on our ethics. There are ethical constraints that a leader must live underneath regardless of the negative consequences that, that might have. I see that uh, Dion or somebody's uh, trying to talk. Did somebody have a comment? No, sorry. I actually just was able to join in. Okay. Well, welcome, Dion. I'm Thank glad you. you're with us. Thank you. Okay. So, the next frame. I see somehow Bill muted me. <laughs> I've unmuted myself, Bill. I guess he was tired of hearing me. Uh, Sorry about all. that. Yeah, I was just, I was muting down uh, Dion when he had, when he came in, but I almost got you too. Okay. Good. Uh, that's fine. Um, the symbolic frame. Um, the symbolic frame is the idea that all human beings have an emotional component to them. And if you're trying to uh, encourage change, elicit change, communicate the need for change, being able to communicate that through symbolism can make you uh, more effective as a leader. Um, the fact is the use of symbols taps into an emotion, that emotional component that people have. Now let me talk about you know, what, what are symbols. Symbols aren't necessarily just, let's say, a brand mark on a product. Uh, a symbol can be a phrase, in, in, the, um, in the U.S. presidential election between Ronald Reagan and uh, the other guy. <laughs> Shows how much I remember the other guy. I think it was Walter Mondale. Ronald Reagan grabbed on a phrase, where's the beef? Now, that was based upon 
a commercial where a lady was going in and buying a hamburger and the bun was very large and the hamburger was very tiny. And all Ronald Reagan had to do uh, at different times when Walter Mondale made a comment, he could totally defeat what Walter Mondale was saying, but just simply say, where's the beef? And he didn't have to say anything more. <laughs> and it was amazing that that one phrase was a, was a major determinant factor in Ronald Reagan becoming president. Now, Ronald Reagan was also known as the great communicator. And another place where Ronald Reagan used, uh, used symbolism was uh, when he was showing a Russian uh, rocket that could deliver a nuclear warhead, and he showed a U.S. rocket. And the U.S. rocket was very tiny, and the Russian rocket was very big. Now, the Russian rocket could only deliver one nuclear warhead aimed at one location. The U.S. rocket could deliver multiple warheads aimed at multiple locations and do uh, quantitatively dramatically more data. But visually, the two were side by side, and Ronald Reagan successfully convinced a major segment of the American population that we were behind because the Russian rocket was bigger. Just a fascinating use of the symbolic frame. Uh, use of the symbolic frame can trigger um, not just structural frame biases on people, but also human resource and political frame biases. All right. Uh, I see we've used uh, 25 minutes, 22 minutes of our 20 minutes. So, so let Excuse me. Excuse me, Dr. Leach. Yes. Quick question. Um, that example you gave of Ronald Reagan uh, in Portland, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There's all sorts of background. Can you start again? Yes. That metaphor of Ronald Reagan using um, the 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 image of the two rockets. Right. Was instructive because while it was effective, it didn't. Um, it didn't qualify based on what you said about how a leader ought to operate under ethical standards, uh, came across as a, um, manipulative and not authentic and sincere. Okay. Um, first of all, I acknowledge your comment. Second of all, um, we all grow up in different both natural, national cultures and family culture. And the family culture I grew up in, manipulation was a high art. It was highly valued. And my mother practiced it continually with me. And so I don't necessarily personally view manipulation as being unethical. Okay. On the other hand, I do believe that if, if through manipulation you are untruthful, that is wrong. And I do believe that Ronald Reagan was untruthful in some of the conclusions he was having people tap into. But does that help? Uh, yes, because I think what, what you're talking about, at least for me, is persuasion. Persuasion yes. has a much more positive connotation than manipulation, and perhaps they are the same thing, but I don't see them as the same thing. Well, that's right. One, one shows a greater respect for the person. Uh, the other uh, is more of a kind of sleight of hand phenomenon. I don't want to get caught up on that, but I just want to- No, that's right. Well, well and let me, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Uh, are no, you no, done? No, I was through. Okay. Let me share with you a German phrase called clever. And it specifically deals with the MBA phenomena within the structural frame. If after you have made a presentation to a German business executive that is purely structurally frame orientated, okay? And if he looks at you and says, you are a very clever man, okay? In the US culture, you would think, oh, that's a good thing, right? To be clever. Mm. 
Yes, in the U.S. In Germany, what he is saying is, you have all these numbers. I don't trust you as an individual. Wow. And therefore, I am completely discounting your structural frame argument. I don't know where your error is, but you are deliberately trying to deceive me with numbers. And I just don't have the time to figure out where your numbers are wrong. So it speaks to the issue of character. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Now, and we're going to get into this also in the uh, Mintzberg uh, organizational structure. And, we're all, and you're also going to have to respond to this in, in some way, I believe, based on how I've written some of the discussion questions. Okay. But I've got a, I have a personal working hypothesis. Okay. This is my hypothesis. But I'm asking you to think about it and potentially respond to it right now today. My hypothesis is that frontline managers, uh, specifically what's called the operating core, uh, because of the nature of their work, tend to operate predominantly out of both the structural frame and the human resource frame. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to get into this more on the uh, on the Mintzberg thing. And, and actually, there is some discussion of this concept itself buried within the four frame book, but it's, it's not dramatically highlighted, if you will. Uh, but what do each of you or some of you think of that, that concept that if you're managing people that are directly interacting with customers and directly doing the work of the organization, should be managed to follow the rules and there should be rules for them and we need to ethically treat them well as employees. <clears throat> Anybody want to comment? If not, I can move on. All right, let me move on. Oh, hold on a second, Doc. So you were you were basically your hypothesis was that mainly your front your your of the core operational managers or your core members they they predominantly work in the structural frame and the human resource frame. Right. And of those, we are we talking about in the effective uh, side of it or the ineffective side of it? Uh, I believe that it helps them to be effective in doing their own personal mission. And which that's would, why they do it. Which for the most part of their daily responsibilities, they would not have to manage in the frames of being symbolic or political. Correct. It would be less important for them. I'm not saying that you, they shouldn't at times have to operate in those frames because they should. That's the whole point of the reframing concept. But I'm just saying their default mode. Okay, mm -hmm. there, there are two primary frames, uh, and, and, I, and I alluded to, and if I can do it at the end, I'm going to share anecdotally uh, some information about a four-frame test I specifically took to see where my personal orientation was. Um, so can, can I piggyback on Carl's question? Yes. Um, then are you, can we infer then that a leader, a transformational leader, will probably operate more out of the political and the symbolic? Yes. Okay. Absolutely yes. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to get to that again when we talk about Mintzberg's uh, model of the organization. Felicia, I would, your hand up. reaction on your initial question, I would, I would concede the point that yes, they mainly operate out of the structural and the human resource uh, frame. But well, that's a hypothesis. You know, we want them to operate. Yeah, it's a hypothesis. I'm just putting it out for you to think about. But when you do your own project at the end of the uh, doctoral program, uh, you may have to, by the nature of your project, change how uh, frontline managers behave. And, and to know that, I think, is an important, important piece. Now, the way you're going to get them to change is not through structural or human resource frame arguments. 
you're going to get them to change by using the symbolic and the political frame. So let me move. Let me move to my second hypothesis. We got two hands up. Oh, go, oh, go ahead, please. Uh, Felicia, you were first. Go ahead. Okay, Dr. Leach, could I also ask you for the operational? Um, I mean, like in your hypothesis, does it also depend on the industry? But it all no. depends. Well, it it, it, it operation person works in. Um, hold on, I I clicked the wrong button. I'm trying to get to a specific slide deeper into the. I'm going to take a slide out of sequence. Okay. Um, over here, you're going to see. Mintzberg's model, that is his, his generic model, and you're going to see five groups. You'll see the largest group is something called the operating core. The operating core is the portion of the organization that is dealing directly with customers and is doing the business of the business. And so my hypothesis is that if your responsibilities, regardless of industry, is in the operating core, you're more likely as a manager, and I stress the word manager versus leader because they're two different concepts in my mind. A manager is more likely to use the children. However, there are always exceptions. Let me give you my most favorite suggestion. Um, exception. If the business of the business is people related, uh, then the operating core manager um, might be putting more emphasis on the human resource frame as opposed to the structural frame, or if the business of the business uh, depends upon uh, something we're going to talk about later on called the, the web of inclusion, um, then the operating core, an operating core manager might be very regularly um, operating out of the political frame. So, um, uh, so the, the next piece, you know, before I go back, you go, you, you, you'll notice at the top of the pyramid, this is meant to kind of look like a pyramid. You, you'll notice at the top of the pyramid, there's something called the strategic gate pass. When I use the phrase senior executives, I'm really talking about the strategic gate pass within this model. So with that in mind, let me, uh, let me uh, get back to uh, this the slide that I was on. All right, so the political frame and the symbolic frame, and let me stress, the political frame is about uh, stakeholder relationships and stakeholder management, okay? And the symbolic frame is about how do you communicate to others the need for action, the need for change. And, and my hypothesis is that the strategic apex within, um, within um, Mintzberg's model, within any organization, there is a strategic apex. Uh, the strategic apex is more likely to operate out of the political frame and the symbolic frame. They have to operate out of the political frame to keep their job. If you alienate too many stakeholders, you will lose your job. That is an axiom that, that I guarantee you, I don't care, irrespective of, of the organization you're in and anything else, if you, if you upset enough stakeholders, you're gone. And then the symbolic frame is all about how to communicate the need for change. Uh, any, would anyone like to comment one way or the other, ask a, ask a question about this point? Any hands up?
Courtney has had his hand up. Uh, it, it, was, no, it was before the, the question before that we we're discussing. Uh, not this one, but I, I was drawing the, make it, trying to make the point that the that your culture uh, will determine or will will guide or cause someone to put emphasis on the frame that they will use. Yes, um, you know, depends on where you are from and how we see people and how we we do business. So that's the point I wanted to, to have made earlier. Okay, exactly. That's my third point on this slide. <laughs> So let's talk about, you're, you're a great lead-in person to, to my discussion of my third point. I am absolutely convinced, based on the research of a fellow by the name of Gert Hofstede, and I am sure that later on, you know, I'm working with Bill on the discussion questions and in, in in mod modules later on in this course, and I guarantee you I'm going to have some discussion questions around Gert Hosteed and his research. Okay. But Gert Hosteed's research is such that, that I don't know which one, but there's at least one national culture out there who will that will 100% reject any one of these four frames. Okay. And there's at least one national culture out there that is going to have a frame that will be incomprehensible to the authors of the textbook we're discussing. Mm. And it is critical, it is critical that for your project on, you know, you, you step back and you think through the national culture implications of what you're about to do and whether or not you're going to use some of this material and how you're going to use some of this material. I want to give you, though, a great example in Hostie's research of the German culture versus the Swedish culture on a cultural dimension called masculinity versus femininity. Now, without getting deep into the, you know, Gert Hasse's research at this point, because that really needs to be a totally separate lecture. Um, it's a continuum of how masculine or feminine, and I understand that's just a label, okay, that, that Hasse put on certain behavior, a culture is. In Germany, You want to make sure that you're doing the best you can possibly do when you go to work. It is just so ingrained from childhood in that culture. If you're showing up to work, the most rewarding job is where you can be the best at what you're doing. Doesn't mean you have to be the best among everybody doing that work, for you personally, you have to be the best. It's you comparing yourself to you. The Swedish culture is at the, is that, is at the opposite end of the extreme on this particular cultural thing. And within the Swedish culture, the most important thing for the individual is to like what they're doing while they're at work. Dramatically different orientations. And so what will more likely work for in the German culture may not work at all in the Swedish culture. Uh, does that fit with what you were asking, Courtney? Yeah, that's correct. Fits perfectly. Okay. Any other comments on the third bullet before I move on? Okay. I, I'm now going to transition into something called a model of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, first of all, this model is, is uniformly within uh, certain cultures, national cultures, viewed as, as absolutely true. Interestingly enough, when Maslow first hypothesized uh, this, uh, this concept, this hierarchy of needs, he had no empirical data, he had no research to base it on. It was just purely his own personal idea. But it was a paradigm, it was a frame. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is in and of itself a frame in the same way there's a structural frame and a human resource frame. 
Now, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, most people blindly tend to assume it's a human resource frame orientation. It is not. It is its own orientation. Um, but the idea is that mankind, and but more specifically, a specific individual, needs to have their lower order needs met before they are going to put any energy in their higher order needs. And this is a, a Darwinian view of the world that if you, if you don't do the, the more basic stuff, you're not going to survive, you're not going to reproduce. Uh, and, and so, as w so the way this, uh, this uh, diagram is to be read is at the bottom of the pyramid is the most basic need. And until that's met, you're not going to move on to the next need on to the next need and on to the next need and ultimately to self-actualization. Um, I'm not, I would not make the statement that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is universal across all national cultures. Uh, but it clearly is widely adopted in U.S. research. And even in my own um, dissertation, when I wrote my dissertation, I, one of the key fundamental concepts I started with was Maslow's hierarchy of needs, because I had to address that concept uh, with that. Uh, the book talks about Maslow's hierarchy of needs in more detail. It's important that if you haven't, don't have a firm understanding of that, that you know that. It's just a general piece of, of theory you, sh you should know. Um, I don't specifically have a slide on Heglison's uh, web of inclusion, so let me just conceptually talk about that there. Heglin's web of, of inclusion is, is in of itself, you could consider it a frame. Remember, a frame is a model of how the world works. That, imp that the way you can uh, cause change within a culture within a system is to get as many stakeholders involved and as many constituencies involved as possible. And within the web of inclusion, the person seeking to make the change does not put themselves at the top of a pyramid of a hierarchical structure. Rather, they view themselves as at the center of a broader system, and it is about facilitation, more about facilitation and less about leadership. Um, my personal opinion, again, this is not in the textbook. This is my own hypothesis. My own hypothesis as it deals with Hegelin's wave of inclusion is that it is a valuable structural tool to use by the strategic apex as they operate within the political frame. I don't know if anybody wants to talk about, you know, from their national culture, the importance of driving consensus and making sure that, it, that that decision making is inclusive and it is less about what the structural frame rules would say we should do and more about uh, for the realities of us as a group together what we should be doing. Does anybody want to make a comment? I would like to make a comment. Um, what I've seen in my experience, especially of um, here in the States and then working a little bit abroad is that you have culture vultures. Uh, you have individuals that know these different sophisticated models of you know, how to get things done. And sometimes they appear to seek out consensus, but they're really, they have a pre-formulated agenda. So they're just really trying to funnel your feedback into a predetermined um, arena that they've already decided on. Subjectively, I have also experienced that, and I end up just based on my personality start to become an obstructionist when I believe that that's really what's happening. And there have been times 
uh, when I was the leader over someone doing that, and I have stopped the meeting right in its tracks for ethical considerations and specifically said, look, it's obvious you're trying to drive this group to a, in a specific direction. What is it you're trying to accomplish? Just state it to the group. Let's deal with it and move on. And I'll tell you, I believe I'm not typical as a senior executive, okay? I'm atypical in that. Uh, but I, I personally ascribe, although I don't have research to back it up, what you just said, Courtney. Would someone else like to comment, though, on the power of actually seeking consensus legitimately? Yes, yes. Um, I would say that uh, it depends on the circumstances. There are times when you have to adopt a more adaptive style of leadership. So, for example, in cases of emergency uh, where things are dire, you don't want, always have, uh, where the threat is imminent, you don't always have an opportunity to develop consensus. Uh, I think a perfect example of that uh, is 9-11. Uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani's um, numbers are in the, in the toilet. But because he took control in a more autocratic uh, style of leadership uh, and was able to direct people at a time when things were uncertain and confusing, he was lauded for that. The same style of leadership uh, prior to that uh, and even after that was highly criticized. Yes. Would you say that uh, in that situation of 9-11, the mayor of New York was operating out of the structural frame. Would I say he was operating out of it? Yes. Um, yes, I would say so. Yeah, it was all about, let's do the best job we can with our police resources. Let's do the best job we can about our pol police resources. Let's do the best thing we can going forward to have the mission of never again, I'm gonna protect you, that is going to become the focus of my administration. But I think uh, the thing I'm kind of driving at is simply yeah. that while it may work for a moment, right. uh, given a situation, it's not the preferred style of operating, particularly when you start introducing factors like age. Uh, my experience with millennials is, is all about developing consensus and collaboration. And if you can't do that, uh, you'll find them to be, as you pointed out, in terms of your own personality, that obstructionists. Yeah. Um, let me just stress, you know, again, a, a, a con continual um, underlying belief and theme of mine, okay? Um, we have to be careful when we're thinking about, from a U.S. cultural perspective, sure what works and i can clearly tell you that uh judy uh, is again i'm bad with names the mayor of new york and the way he's operating consistently would be viewed as a, an, an effective manager in germany hmm. okay i will be uh, sure to make i will make sure that i qualify my con Probably no, I, about uh, by saying you know from an American context and then being more specific about my particular context, uh, even within America. Sure, sure. Um, we're going to, I'm sure, in this course later on, get deeper into Hofstede, Gert Hofstede's um, uh, research, and I know for sure I'm going to get into this some of this concept again next week when we talk about writing the way. Dr. Well, let, me, let, me, let me move on. Um, we've used uh, 45 minutes. I'm going to make a structural frame comment. We've used 45 minutes of our 75 minutes, and I, and I desperately want to leave time uh, for symbolic frame-oriented stories of mine after I've got the lecture done. So I'm going to move on unless someone needs to say something about either he listens web of inclusion or Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, 
Contemporaneous with Maslow, there was a fellow by the name of McGregor. And McGregor coined a theory on X versus Y managers. And let me stress something about McGregor. McGregor also had no empirical research to back up his theory. He just read Maslow's theory and said, that's a great theory. I'm going to extend it. And I'm going to artificially create a concept of an X manager, which is a bad manager, a bad person. And someone who's a Y manager, who's a very nurturing manager, and therefore a bad manager in an X will always get uh, inferior results to a more nurturing manager in the same situation. So, pure classical, and by the way, um, X and Y management has become part of the parlance within U.S. management culture in business. When you say that's theory X or theory Y, people instantaneously know what you're trying to say. And theory, theory X is always brings with a negative connotation and theory Y always brings with a positive connotation. Doc, Dr. Leach? Yes. What about theory Z? I'm not, Theory Z, I'm not talking about that because it's not in the book and I don't know enough about it and haven't studied it. What is Theory Z? Theory Z was made popular in the, um, the 80s and the early 90s, which, uh, which said that if you gave an employee a lifetime commitment for a job and were willing to, willing to pour into that employee, you would reap uh, greater loyalty, greater productivity. Okay, that that is a subset of theory Y. Okay, the other thing that I'm is an say, Go ahead. The other thing I'm going to say is, if you use this schema, in my estimation, to talk yeah. about what companies do, I think it's more complex. Uh, I think that there are companies uh, that do see people as expendable. There are companies that see people uh, as those you want to keep. They have institutional knowledge. They have skill set that you want to build on. But I think even within companies, you will find that there are certain people that are invested in, that are poured in, and other people who seem to be expendable. At least that's my impression, uh, okay. that, it, that it's, it's easier to replace some people at the lower rung of the ladder than it is to replace people in the middle and at the top. Uh, let me talk for briefly about IBM's culture going into um, the 1980s. IBM, had, and let me also talk about a company called Pella Corporation. Um, and I need to be mindful of the time though. Um, IBM's corporate culture when it originally was started was employment for life. We are going to invest upon, we're going to invest in you as employees. Um, and they had a no layoff policy. Hmm. Okay. And they did regular, and they always made sure that there was a two tier uh, promotional system where you could either move up based upon positional responsibility or you could move up based upon um, technical effectiveness. And a frontline person could make as much who was extremely strong technically and, and had grown over the years down that path, could make as much as, as a supervisor at three or four levels above them um, uh, because of that. Uh, Pella Corporation, I work for, uh, for Pella Corporation, they, they also had the rule of employment for life. And if there was a downturn, in the company's finances, there was a mandatory pay cut between five and 8% across the board of every employee, but they did not let anybody go, period. Now, if you're sitting there and all of a sudden they come in one day and say, for the good of the company, for the next X number of quarters, um, your, your pay is cut 5%, that's painful but you didn't lose your job. 
and they also were continually investing in their employees with a five to 10 year time horizon. Um, the theory why is that employees operate best based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and they're always going to want as a person uh, to work for social esteem and self-actualization. And then a manager is not a manager, he's a facilitator, she's a facilitator, okay? When Maslow, remember, uh, McGregor was a contemporary of Maslow. When Maslow read what McGregor said, he erupted strongly wow. and wrote papers about why McGregor was absolutely wrong. And it is, and, and you don't need to go read them at this point, but you need to have it in the back of your mind. And here's what Maslow's point was. There are people by the nature of either their capability or their personality or the fact that they have not yet met their more baser needs that have to be managed through what we would call the structural frame. Now, it's not saying you don't treat them with dignity, okay? It's just saying there are certain people, certain jobs that can only be performed by following the rules. And we cannot afford, for example, when an ambulance is rolling up to an emergency room, to have the person who's first unloading the, the person from the ambulance and doing the initial triage assessment to not follow the rules, period, non-negotiable. So you need to, as you read about McGregor's theory action, the theories why. Now, um, Again, if we have time anecdotally, I will come back and talk about some of my own research on whether, whether the fundamental statement that X, uh, managers who use X are less effective than those who use Y on objective structural frame measurement basis. All right, men's spurts, the visional form. You're gonna to need to understand this uh, to answer the discussion questions. And to to write to it, and more important though, I want to spend uh, some time on the on the divisional form of this uh, as well. Um, there are, there are five groups. I've already given you my hypothesis that the operating core operates out of uh, the, the structural and the human resource frame, and the strategic uh, frame operates out of. Uh, the strategic apex operates out of the symbolic and the political frame. What about support staff? Support staff and the way you manage support staff tend to be towards a McGregor manager Y orientation. And the reason for that is support staff tend to have uh, advanced education. And at least in the US, and particularly among millennials within the US today, tend to expect um, a McGregor style uh, Y orientation, which means support staff themselves expect the predominant way you're going to manage them is through the human resource frame. Let's talk, but interestingly enough, Support staff creates the rules that the operating core has to live with. Um, I'm not looking for verbal um, acknowledgement. I know some of you, this is your first course at Baki, but others not. Uh, there is the book, The Joy of Work, that, uh, I, and I don't know if we're gonna have uh, Mr. Baki as, as part of this course uh, at a certain point, uh, last last year we did, um, but Mr. Baki had some very strong statements he made about underneath this model what would be support staff, and the fact that he would just soon have personally have 
as some more as small support staff as possible because they were making too many rules and those rules were in essence negatively impacting the joy 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 at work um, techno structure techno structure are the people who who create uh, the technology underneath which the organization operates um, legal at times though might be within the, the technical structure so it isn't just you know computer type people in the technical structure middle line middle line are those managers who and the middle line is the difference between being a manager and an executive and then the strategic apex is the difference between being a senior executive and an executive. So in general, a middle line manager is the most vulnerable to having to operate in all four frames. They themselves need to be able to use the political, more important, they need to use the symbolic frame to communicate downward to the operating core, uh, the change they want. On the other hand, if they're not astute enough in the political frame, um, they're going to get killed at some point by the strategic apex because they will have alienated uh, a, uh, a stakeholder group. So of the, f of the five groups within here, um, the middle line tends to have to operate in all four frames simultaneously, which is virtual. I'm going to tell you that's virtually impossible to do. Let me talk about now the divisional form because it's 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 where uh, my personal career has been. It's where uh, I spent a majority of my life. Uh, first of all. Let's take a look at the operating core and, and, and the, the divisional form is this one right here on the left hand side, on the right hand side of your screen. You'll notice the operating core is made up of smaller complete diagrams of the one on the left. Each of those uh, smaller structures within the operating core are strategic business units. In many situations, those strategic business units are operating in foreign countries. Then you'll notice there is a strategic apex, and you will notice that there's a, a fairly larger support staff and a fairly smaller technology staff at the at the corporate level and you'll notice down here in the in each of the smaller divisional forms they have their own technology you know they have their own technical techno structures and they have their own full-blown support staff my hypothesis to you is the person running the person at the strategic apex within a strategic business unit where that strategic business unit um, is, in a, is in a specific national culture, it is best if the strategic apex leader is from that culture. Now, are there, now there are legitimate reasons why um, for centuries that was not the business model. And there is the the um, the concept of expatriates coming from the strategic apex that it is best aligned with the um, national culture of the strategic apex, and they send their executives to be the head of the strategic apex country by country. Um, there's some very interesting research on Royal Dutch Shell that that even as recent as 2003 talks about there are still benefits at times from having, having expatriates as, as part within your tool set. Uh, we will be getting much deeper though into this concept next week when we talk about, um, talk about writing the ways of culture. So at this point, I've got 15 minutes left. 
but that's not the right word. We have 15 minutes left to learn from each other. So before I get into my symbolic frame stories, and I'll only do that if you all don't have comments, I, I truly want to open up the floor to comments and, and your feedback to me. I just wanted to, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation thus far, Dr. Leach. Um, I wanted to comment on the middle line managers, the executive sure. slash managers. I think out of all of those in the agency under Mitzberg's model, they are the most likely to actually operate in all four frames, uh, simply based on how they're only my experience in dealing with uh, nonprofits, mid size and small nonprofits in the States they are hit by every group. They are hit by the strategic apex. They're hit by support staff, techno and the legal side, as well as the frontline staff, where they're consistently uh, having to relay the symbolism that's coming from the top. They have to be very political and savvy, but they also have to operate in the structural and the HR day to day. So of, of anyone on that, that model, I think they are most likely to operate in all four, not now how effectively they do that. That definitely, I think, in my personal opinion, is up for debate. But I think a lot of organizations are set up and they pull on that group in the, in the middle really hard. It is a very hard role to place because you have to be able to manage managers. And you can't directly impact your key performance indicators that you're going to live and die by. Key performance indicators, I'd remind you, are structural frame um, orientation. However, um, at the same time, you've got to know how to keep your people happy, not through the they're intervening layers of managers and supervisors and to do that you need to be very astute on the human resource frame but the facts are politically you have to survive and the facts are uh, it's your responsibility to uh, create the right symbolic frame based communication so so with that let me let me bring you back to the divisional form for a second okay um, each of these little strategic apexes must, within their local country, use symbolic use a symbolic phrase in a in a way that makes sense for the national culture they're trying to impact. Yeah, way up here at the strategic apex, they have all the power, and they're used to their symbolic frame communications to be instantaneously recognizable within their own home national culture and they can become quite confused when they try to and let me give you let me uh, let me give you one of my my brief brief stories but then i want to turn it back over i was sitting in a meeting i happened to be in the country of germany I was with uh, seven other people from various European uh, countries, and I was talking about the uh, marketing concept of, of, of a market basket pricing. And I made the mistake of saying, do you know when you go to the grocery store and you grab some bread and you throw it into your shopping cart and you grab some meat and you throw it in your shopping cart and you grab your vegetables and you throw them in the shopping cart and then you push your shopping cart to the cash register and you pay for everything at once. And everybody in the room broke out laughing at me. It was, and I'd say, you know, what, what, you know, what's so funny? And then the, and my, and the German said, Bob, as soon as we're done, we're taking you to a supermarket. I went to the supermarket, and guess what? If I picked a piece of meat, I had to pay the person inside this bigger supermarket for the meat right then and there. Same thing with the vegetables, same thing with the bread. 
it was, it, you know, I got caught. It was like gotcha, where I was trying to use a symbol that would have been instantaneously recognized in the U.S. culture that just made me look foolish. The exact opposite of what I was trying to accomplish with everyone else in the room, because none of the rest of the people in the room were from, were from the U.S. culture. They were from six other cultures. Anyways, someone else, please. Um, Dr. Leach, I have a question. This hypothesis that we are learning today seems to be very, I mean, it seems to come out from organizations which are mid-sized to um, perhaps a bigger size. Yes. But I, I see a lot of organizations today are very small. They're much smaller. We have a lot of non-profit. Mm -hmm. But even, profit, even for profit business, businesses are getting smaller. So do you, do, you, do you think that this model still work in today's context? Or do you see a lot of this structure actually being, um, I mean, there's a blur, there's a blurring of the structures itself. And like, you know, just now you commented that it's very difficult for a person to work all the four structures, all the four frames. But I think a lot more um, in my own culture, or even for that matter, you know, working in churches, um, I see that, you know, a lot of, um, a lot more, even volunteers and even people that are working in the church office are actually having to, to work through all the four uh, frames for that matter. All right. all right, so let me separate for the moment for you the piece that deals with Minsberg's um, model versus the frames. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I the whole point of Mintzberg's model is that these five things have to be done by a business of any size. Now we're talking a for-profit business here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And even if it's a sole proprietor, they still need to do these five things. Okay. So it's it's very it's much I'm sorry. Is it very much more structural than just theory? Um, I'm not sure what that, what you meant by that. Um, could you just be a little more clarifying? Um, what I mean to say is that generally these models are just not just theoretical models, but they are very operational models, right? Uh, clearly, Mintzberg's is meant to be an operational model. It's an operational view of the world. All right. Okay. However, let me talk for a few seconds about um, nonprofits mm -hmm. and churches. That's why I exposed you to Heglison's Web of Inclusion. Heglis, many of you are going to discover that Heglison's Web of Inclusion is a better model for you to consider when you do your final project. It may help you solve more practical problems than uh, the Mintzberg model would be as you're, as you're going to recommend organizational changes. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, one other thing, I, you know, I had meant to talk about Hegelson's model. Hegelson's model, you cannot be successful at the strategic apex of a very large organization if you don't practice Eagleson's model as a person. Now, again, that's, I'm going to say this as an hypothesis because I don't have specific research that I can point to. This is my own personal opinion, and I always state those as hypotheses. So don't put in your paper, Dr. Leach said on this date that, and somehow treat it like it's, it's a legitimate, peer-reviewed source of information. All right, thank you. We have five more minutes. Awesome. Uh, doc. Uh, yes. Right. Um, let, let me thank you for, you know, opening my eyes some more. Uh, read the frames. And, um, and there are some things that came out that I want to reinforce in terms of culture is important, fundamental. Um, it's tied to the people, and in order to make assessment, one needs to see them through the eyes or the lens of, of, of the culture.
right? Uh, I work within the, the, the police force, right? I'm an officer in the police force. So, so, so you find that um, the, the structure uh, is important. Um, the consensus is not always, uh, always the, 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 the primary um, rule. Uh, you know, it is from top down, uh, so to speak. How, how, do, how, do you, how, how do you make for an assessment on that, Doc? In terms of a police organization? In, okay. in terms of, uh, for, first of all, what national culture did you grow up in? Uh, Jamaica, Jamaica. Okay, and what national culture are you operating in right now? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's really one in terms of... Um, it's consensual in terms of consensus. No, no, I didn't mean it that way. I, what yeah. I meant was, are you still working in Jamaica? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So, so in support of, in encouragement of what you just said, read the book, Writing the Waves of Culture. Yes. It exactly starts with the assumption that what you just said is accurate. Okay, okay. But more important, that book is going to talk about some fundamental concepts that if you all of a sudden were threat, pick a culture that you don't know anything about, just, just name one, a country you don't know anything about. Mm, say Russia, well, well, well I, 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 a little. Or for example, Russia, yeah. All right, so let's say Someone came to you from the Jamaican government and said, you have an opportunity to participate in an exchange program <laughs> and would you like to go to Vladivostok <laughs> for six months to do, do your job there? What would you think of that? Well, if it's been paid and for the experience, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be paid. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. The book we're covering next week is going to explain fundamental concepts of what you would need to know and what you would need to do to be successful in that context. Okay. Does that no help? Noted. noted. Yes, Doc. Thanks. Okay. M Mandawa wanted to say something. Go ahead, please. Um, I wanted to find out uh, those um, those frames uh, can one possibly uh, effectively apply them using servanthood leadership? You know that that's a that's a great question, and without getting too deep into detail, my answer is yes. And that certain of those frames are going to be more effective than others as you talk about the seven dimensions of uh, leadership. Um, well, yes. So um, in our culture, we, it's strongly top down, highly bureaucratic, um, even the church culture and the public sector culture. Yeah. So um, as a budding consultant, I just started very recently in trying to build up a consultancy. And I'm looking at what's been happening in organizations within the church and within the public sector. The people at the top generally are looked at as the bad guys, the ones who are allowing corruption to happen, the ones who are not um, managing effectively, etc., etc. And so, and so, um, the people in the middle, the middle line that we were talking about using Minsworth's model, uh, those are the people who tend to have more sort of a passion and concern uh, that um, the organizations grow and uh, develop and people goals are reached and stuff like that. And changes are made and that changes are sustained. Right. So there is a need for the middle line to effectively communicate that to the strategic apex. Generally, in our culture, people are not going to want to rock the boat. Mm -hmm. And so what what happens is that we live in a cycle of futility, 
you know, the same things happen over and over again. We sit in little corners and we chat about our situations. And so um, I remember a long time ago reading an article by Michael Hyatt, and uh, he was talking about how the middle line can influence the thinking of the, you know, the people at the top, the CEOs mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, I tried to share one of my papers with the district leader of our country and um, I haven't heard back from him. But in my position, I need to be able to leverage these relationships I'm building with people. And I'm strong on personally growing servant leaders who will build healthy organizations. That's kind of my mission. So what, what are some thoughts about uh, uh, the middle line influence in the strategic apex and me in the middle of this all. Okay. Uh, boy, there's a lot, a lot of content there. <laughs> We're already past the 15 minutes. So if people want to drop off that, I guess that's okay. But, but let me try to, let me just try to respond. But let me also encourage that we start next week by also picking this same question back up, but now based upon the new material, okay? Um, I would encourage you to go to Gert Hofstede's uh, website on national cultures. I would encourage you to first pull up and read what his research, and let me stress something about Gert Hofstede versus everything we've talked about up to this point. Gert Hofstede's research is based on true empirical research that was done in a scientific way and done in a very rigid, using the rigid scientific method. It is accurate. It is absolutely accurate. Okay. So read first what he says about your culture. And I believe, you know, the national culture, you know, that you're talking about. And I think that's going to be enlightening to you and give you some ideas. Um, you yourself, because you're a consultant and the nature of the work you're doing, you're trying to build a business that depends upon Eagleson's web of inclusion. And if you can't get your, the value you bring recognized by a strategic apex, you will not have clients. The key is that once you can, organization by organization, using the web of inclusion, get a specific strategic apex at an organization, then you will have a wonderful opportunity in a non-threatening way towards the middle line management. Understand and document and free up their thoughts that you could then present to the strategic apex in a way that will not make the middle line vulnerable. Is there anything I just said makes some sense? Did it add any value what I just said? Yes, yes, thank you. And um, I'm actually thinking of asking the minister, hopefully later on this afternoon, um, the minister of communities, because when I did my research uh, for Fresno, I used the Ministry of Communities, which is a recently formed ministry uh, uh, after elections in 2015. And so um, we haven't had, we have not had local government elections for about 22 years. So there's okay. a whole, there's a critical need for organizational assessment. So I am hoping that he would agree that I can use this course uh, when I do the organizational assessment right. that he is asking us to do, that I can use that. And then it's going to be like real live information for him to have a upfront and personal look at what's really happening, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yes, thank you. It makes sense. And I'm going to check um, Hofstede's. Huff, and uh, I would love, of course, any kind of input from my fellow um, colleagues in the class. Thanks a lot, Dr. Leach. Okay. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Bill Payne because we're uh, seven minutes over the 75 minutes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Leach. Really appreciate the presentation.
there's been some good comments too going on in the uh, the chat room. And Carl, you put up several websites. I think they'll be very helpful. I'm I'm going to just copy those, and I think I'll send those out in an email to the uh, to the class, just so everyone has uh, as to those websites. And one of them was the Hofstede site that uh, Dr. Leach has been referring to. So again, yeah, we are kind of just about out of time, but I appreciate everything that uh, has gone on today. Uh, we, as Dr. Leach has said, we'll be getting together next week, uh, same time, same place, Zoom room, uh, to talk about uh, cultural issues in relationship to uh, assessing organizations. And uh, week after that, I think we're going to probably talk about the distributive management system, which of course is going to be a little different than we, than we see here on the Mitzberg model. Uh, Dennis Bakke, who won't be able to be with us this year. He's had some health issues that are really preventing. I, I have asked uh, Brad Smith, president of Bakke, if he would be willing to join us, and he hasn't gotten back to me yet since we do use the Joy at Work model uh, at BGU quite a bit. But uh, we'll do a little discussing of that, that issue and, and kind of contrast it to some of the uh, issues that we've been talking about here today. So I think with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, have us all sign off. Uh, again, you can continue in the discussion in the, uh, in the uh, discussion forum. And you know, we're still talking there, of course, about the frames model and the Mitzberg model, and you can kind of talk with each other a little more uh, about some of these issues. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and sign off and uh, be talking with you in the weekly assignments and, and what's going on during the week. So again, thanks for joining us all. Bye now.